since I developed uh, interest in this topic in 1975, this is the biggest audience I've ever had a chance to address on, on any topic involving low carb. So thank you for being here. It's, it's an honor to be here with a, uh, such a remarkable group of speakers and, and the energy um, uh, around this topic suggests that uh, we may be moving this not from the top down but from the bottom up. And uh, I applaud you for, uh, for the, your interest. What I want to talk about loosely is the art and science of low carbohydrate diet and low carbohydrate performance. And um, when I say art and science, I, I'm a, I was trained as a scientist, but I realized that there is also an art uh, involved in understanding uh, the roots and the uh, uh, proper composition of a uh, ketogenic or low carb diet. Um, and so what I want to start with is, is a bit of the art of understanding where that came from and maybe some key learnings that came from uh, individuals who use this diet not from a scientific perspective but from a cultural perspective. So what I show you here is a picture of two women facing the camera. This may be the, certainly the first camera they ever saw and it may be the first European origin person holding it. And I will tell you that these two women knew more about the low carb diet than I will ever know in terms of the practical aspects of how do you choose which foods, how do you cook it, how do you give it to your, your family so that your infants, your teenage kids, your uh, spouse, and your, your in-laws all are happy with what you feed them. Um, and you know, how the Inuit uh, of the Arctic um, proportion their food, you know, we know they eat meat and fat, which parts did they treasure? Which parts did they discard? If you look in the garbage dump around, you know, settlement areas, you know, uh, uh, archaeological anthropologists go and look and dig through garbage heaps and, and say, well, they ate this and this. Well, actually, what you find in the dump is what they didn't eat. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, these were a, a very evolved, the women were part of a very evolved society. Uh, and the Thule Inuit had lived, um, had come across from Siberia probably about a thousand years before, and before them, um, uh, other um, 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 uh, Ar Inuits had, <clears throat> had lived in the Arctic for 4,000 years. Uh, and they lived in a very hostile environment, yet they figured out how to survive and how to have a continuous food supply, uh, and uh, how to uh, uh, give birth to and raise uh, children who could survive in that environment. But they never wrote down uh, a book such as The Art of Inuit Cooking. So we don't know, you know, they died with that knowledge and uh, uh, not much was written, to, you know, people didn't literally take from these people's mouths what they did. There were people who did listen to and write down what the Inuit did. This is a, um, actually a painting that uh, uh, stemmed from an Arctic expedition that was uh, mounted by a gentleman named Dr. Frederick Swatka. Uh, and he uh, was a, uh, a, a physician in the U.S. Army, uh, but for whatever reason decided he wanted to go into the Arctic and try to find the fate of the, U of the, uh, of the Royal Navy's uh, lost Franklin Expedition. The Franklin Expedition left Great Britain in 1843. It was last seen going into the uh, Arctic north of Canada, and their mission was to find the North Northwest Passage. Um, across uh, through the Arctic to Asia, for, so it would be a short route, short route to Asia. Um, and they disappeared, they were last seen in 1845, two ships, 129 men disappeared, and it was a great quest in the mid-1800s to find the fate of that expedition. And so Swatka said, well, we'll go up there, and rather than taking all of our food and all of our supplies and you know, try to move our way across the, this, this frozen tundra, let's talk to the people who know how to cross it you know, it's just part of the normal lifestyle. So you see Swatka here with glasses and another guy wearing a European origin you know, a, a coat. And they're taking notes while listening to the Inuit and tell them what they're going to do. And what they did was they uh, packed up their, uh, their food and, and the dogs. There were two families, four of the uh, European origin people. And they set out uh, to try to get to the Arctic coast. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of wisdom that among the Inuit. One was um, you let the dogs do the work. The humans are helping out a bit here. 
But this was not an easy journey because, as you can see, the humans aren't riding on the sled. They have, even when the dogs are pulling the sled, the, the humans were walking. So they walked and, and took these supplies and hunted to feed themselves for 13 months, 3,000 nautical miles. Um, and uh, the, the most intriguing thing from his diary, Stefanson, or I'm sorry, uh, Schmatka didn't write down precisely what the Inuit ate, but what he did say, which I thought was extremely important, was he said, uh, when one first is thrown upon the diet of the native, one is ill disposed to travel. But this soon passes away in the course of two or three weeks. Now, I found this intriguing because I discovered this diary after I'd finished doing my PhD disser dissertation research. I was writing my thesis, and I thought a completely novel uh, observation that I'd made was that it took two or three weeks for a person to adapt to a ketogenic diet. And I got scooped by this guy <laughs> by 100 years. Um, and so I point out that humans can do, once you give them a period of time to adapt, they can do prodigious amounts of, of physical labor. Um, but then people say, yeah, that's fine. But these people had no choice. As you can see, there's not, there are no fields of waving grain and no orchards here. Um, and so they had no choice to, uh, whether they ate a low carbohydrate diet or not. So again, the, argue, the critics say, well, you know, when people give, have a choice, they always eat the carbs. Well, Here's a group of people who were given a choice and as long as they could resisted it. And these are the Maasai uh, 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 nomadic herders who live in the Great Rift, Rift Valley in uh, Eastern Africa. And they had their first contact with Europeans in the mid 1800s. Uh, and into, even up until 19, in 1920s, they were still uh, 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 sticking with their nomadic Aboriginal lifestyle and resisting the, the, the urge of the uh, British colonists to uh, uh, settle into villages and lead a more civilized life, if you will. Um, so in the 1920s, uh, two British uh, uh, scientists went into the, this region and studied them for over a course of a year. And they also studied the Kikuyu people who lived adjacent to them. The Kikuyu were subsistence farmers who lived down in the the, the, uh, along the lake shores and along the rivers, and they farmed. And the Maasai were pure nomadic hunter, or, I'm sorry, pure nomadic herders who lived on the, on the product of their cattle. And their diet consisted of just three things <coughs> meat, milk, and blood. And of course, people say, ew, blood. Uh, but the, the, the fascinating thing here is A, there's not a lot of carbs here. You know, milk has about 5% uh, carbohydrate uh, uh, by volume. Um, but you know, I always wondered about the blood. And, and in, the, in, in the North America, the uh, uh, people who lived on the Great Plains and lived on the buffalo also drank and you know, saved blood from the killed animals and drank it. And it wasn't until I really understood the physiology of nutritional ketosis that I began to get a glimmer of why they did that. And that is, I'll come back to this in my talk later, uh, later this afternoon, when you adapt to a ketogenic diet, the kidneys accelerate their excretion of sodium. Now, if you live in a large, expansive area far away from the ocean, you don't have a source of salt unless you've, somebody has a salt mine and you trade with them. Well, that, you know, these, these people didn't trade in salt. So where did they get their salt? You get it from the blood of your animals, or the animals that you kill. And in the case of the Maasai, they didn't kill them. They would use a, a sharp uh, uh, a lancet, poke the jugular vein of the cow, collect a cup of blood, put a little poultice on, the, on the, the incision, then the cow would live and go off and, and graze and, and lick up little bits of salt here and there. So the cow became the salt collection machine for them so that when they sweat, because they had to run, run hard to, to chase away the large cats trying to, to kill their animals. Um, and you know, as Professor Noakes pointed out, you lose a, a lot of, uh, of you, you sweat to, to, to cool yourself, but you also lose salt in the sweat and you have to replace it. Uh, so it's actually a very clever adaptation to combine blood along with the meat and other um, uh, non-vegetable sources in your diet. Um, again, this is the art of understanding some of the antecedents of the science that hopefully we uh, have and will develop. Uh, now, these are two portraits that were painted in the 1830s by a uh, very capable um, uh, painter by the name of George Catlin, who uh, traveled west of the Mississippi River in, in what's now the United States. At that time, it was the Northwest Territories. Uh, and he traveled among Aboriginal Native Americans 
uh, who had little, if any, influence from uh, 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 European society and particularly for, from agricultural foods. And the thing that people look at this and say, you know, this is kind of a, something wrong with these pictures. This guy really wasn't a good painter because, see, the heads are way too small compared to the size of the body. So either they had 750 cc brains, not the 1500 of, of highly evolved man, or they had very big bodies. You guess which it is. Catlin reported in his, in his writings that these guys were between six and a half and seven feet tall. And these are males of the Osage um, Aboriginal uh, uh, Native American group. Um, and were these guys, you know, were these guys freaks? Were they unusual? Well, we also know that when uh, the explorers Lewis and Clark crossed uh, uh, the, the, what's now continental United States, in the early 1800s, 1805 to 1807, they met with the Osage people uh, and sent a group of Osage leaders back to uh, meet with the, quote, Great White Father, which was our, our uh, president, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and when they went back to meet with Jefferson, there were 14 of them. Jefferson, who we know was six feet uh, two and three-fourths inches tall, he was one of the tallest men in the North America at the time, he described the Osage leaders who came to meet with him as superb men and giants, which means uh, they weren't unusual. And it is quite well known, but uh, if, you, if you scratch below the surface, that many hunting cultures, in many hunting cultures or herding cultures where there is a relative absence of carbohydrate, the people grow very tall. So when people say, well, the, the low-carb diet is imbalanced, you, know, you, you don't have enough nutrients to grow, I mean, these guys found something to make bones and muscle and stuff out of to, to become very tall. And I wouldn't be deterred by the critics who say that, that that's not possible. So Professor Noakes mentioned uh, Professor Stefansson, uh, who was uh, an uh, anthropologist, an early anthropologist trained at, at, at Harvard. And for whatever reason, after he uh, got partway through his training, he decided he wasn't going to stick around and write a dissertation. So he went off to the Arctic for uh, uh, 10 of the next 12 years, lived among the Inuit, learned their language, and came back and wrote those three books that, that Professor Noakes told, uh, showed you, including a book called The Friendly Arctic. Uh, it's kind of a catchy title. Um, and in The Friendly Arctic, uh, he said that he could live for up to two years without any vegetable foods in his diet. No, no um, uh, uh, grains, no uh, leaves, no fruit, uh, and he maintained perfect health. Um, the fact that he came back in 1917 and started writing these books and giving lectures on this topic really upset the nascent nutrition establishment because it was in between 1914 and 1926 that the 12 vitamins were discovered and characterized and a lot of those were found principally in vegetable source foods like vitamin C. And the, the, the experts of the time said this guy is absolutely wrong. And when he persisted in saying that he was right, they called him a liar. So to salvage his reputation, the, he allowed himself to be basically locked up in a uh, hospital in New York City uh, and under constant observation for a full year, ate a diet consisting of just meat and fat. Uh, the two guys who, who uh, uh, um, uh, oversaw that research project um, when they published the results of the, their paper said, um, our experiment failed. Stefansson remained healthy. <laughs> um, but the neat thing is that when they did this experiment, they recorded precisely what he ate. And so now we have a record. Now, okay, let's put it, it's a presumption on my part. But if this guy lived for 10 years among the Inuit, learned their language, learned to eat their diet, and now his reputation is at risk, I would guess that he would do his best to recreate the macronutrient composition of the diet that he ate in the Arctic. And that was written down. What we have is 115 grams of protein per day. This guy was five foot nine. So that represents, depending on his energy expenditure, 15 to 20 percent of his energy intake. Over 200 grams of fat per day and less than 10 grams of carbs. And that's a guess because we're, the, that, less, that carbs would only come from the glycogen that's in the meat at the time the animal was killed. Uh, and he ate meat, fish, poultry. Much of the food was, and this is important, much of the food was boiled. And when he ate the boiled meat, he drank the broth. Uh, 
They also included brains, marrow, liver, and kidneys, so the uh, internal organs of the, of the animal, not just the, the meat. You know, where we're, we in our society are focused on the steak, and, and for the last 40 years, the lean steak, uh, they were picking the fattier cuts, and that's how they got the 200 grams of fat and kept the protein at a, at a moderate level. So I think there's an important message there because there are lots of virgins of, virgins of low carbohydrate diet. And there are people say, well, you know, I eat a, I eat a low carbohydrate diet. And when I talk to them and ask them what they're eating, they're eating less than 50% of their calories is fat. And I say, well, why are you eating that so little fat? Oh, it's the fat's the, da the dangerous part. So my, my co-author and I, Jeff Volek, uh, 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 have been trying to figure out how we kind of depict some of the differences between diets. And so what we've shown here is on the vertical axis, the carbohydrate intake in terms of percent of the diet, and on the horizontal axis, protein intake as percent. And of course, what we don't show here is fat, but if you subtract the, the carbohydrate and the, uh, and the protein, then the difference is fat. And so if you look at a, what we call a well-formulated ketogenic diet, it might be 10% or less carbs up to 20% uh, protein, which means that's got to be over 70% fat. And, but in, when you, in, in both the, the, the published literature and in, kind of on the internet, when people talk about low carbohydrate diets, they typically say that anything under 30% of carbs is low carbohydrate. But if one defines uh, uh, nutritional ketosis as a actual functionally circulating level of ketones where it can actually help the body in its energy flow, um, our estimate is that this triangle here is about the space in which nutritional ketosis can exist. And yet when I talk to people who are academics who, are promote, who, who promote the paleo diet, such as Professor Lauren Cordain, he, he tells me you've got to have at least 20% carbs in the diet. And I ask him why, he says, well, that's how much you need to feed the brain. So if you're going to not use ketones as a brain fuel, yes, you have to have enough carbs to feed the brain. And he also expressed concern about the high intake of fat and saturated fat, and that's why he promotes a, more, a higher protein intake. But in this range up here where we have this paleo, these people are not, anybody following that diet is not going to be in nutritional ketosis. So how do I know that? Well, to some degree, Jeff and I have actually defined the term nutritional ketosis. So it's a little incestuous for me to say that, but if we show here ketones on the, uh, the horizontal axis and then optimal fuel flow to the body, including the brain on the vertical axis, uh, uh, derived from, and we didn't just make this up, we looked at uh, all the scientific literature we can find, including the superb studies done by George Cahill and his group at the Joslin working on, on uh, star, uh, patients on total starvation. Fuel for the brain, ketones act, supplying fuel to the brain, really only begins at about a half a millimolar and becomes substantial at one millimolar of beta hydroxybutyrate and goes up to about three millimolar. And so we just define this as nutritional ketosis. Um, the more protein and or the more carbs you eat, the lower you are here. The less protein and carbs you eat, then the higher you go. And then if you add exercise to the mix, exercise stimulates ketone production. So you, at any one level of carbs and protein, you can have more uh, uh, ketones at higher uh, levels of exercise. If you cut all, all calories, carbs and protein, out of the diet and uh, are in total starvation, you'll have levels between three and five millimolar. Now, why do we call this nutritional ketosis? Because all of us in medicine are taught about ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis is the life-threatening condition that occurs in type 1 diabetics when they're deprived of insulin. And ketoacidosis uh, functions in the 10 to 20 millimolar range. So when I talk to doctors and I talk about ketosis, they say, oh yeah, ketoacidosis, that's bad. And everybody says, well, this is a, ketones are a toxic byproduct of fat metabolism. Well, in this range, they're toxic. Down here, it's a tenfold lower level, one to three, not above 10 to, tw you know, 10 to 20. Uh, you actually have a fuel that is a significant contributor to whole body energy metabolism, particularly to nourish the brain. And that gets us away from that requirement, the, you know, the 130 grams per day that was mentioned previously, or the 20% that Lauren Cordain says, you have to have in order to maintain, you know, to keep the lights on and uh, maintain well-being and function. 
Anyway, so that's really what led us to this concept of a well-formulated ketogenic diet, enough protein to maintain lean body mass, enough minerals to, to uh, maintain physiological function, including the mineral sodium, which if you're sodium depleted and you try to exercise, you're going to feel terrible. Uh, so what led me into, actually into this topic was we were curious about the edict that you had to have carbohydrates for uh, adequate exercise and physical performance. Uh, and that uh, uh, concept of, of carbohydrate requirement and even carbohydrate loading was developed in Scandinavia actually just before World War II in Denmark and subsequently in Sweden in the 1960s. Um, and yet we had met patients who had been on the Atkins diet who told us, you know, I can, I can do quite a bit of exercise, I'm not impaired, and uh, I was quite skeptical of that from my own personal experience, so I was encouraged by a couple of my mentors at the University of Vermont uh, to do a study where we took uh, untrained uh, adults who wanted to lose some weight, who allowed themselves to be basically locked up in a metabolic ward for seven weeks, and we gave them a high carbohydrate weight maintenance diet for the first week and studied their peak aerobic power and endurance to exhaustion. And then we put them on a pretty draconian ketogenic diet, which had no visible carbs and only about 700 calories, six to 700 calories of lean meat, fish, and poultry. And we kept them on that for six weeks. Um, and uh, then we te tested their exercise uh, capacity at one week and six weeks in that six week period. Now, at six weeks, the average person had lost close to, to well, they put it in kilograms, 11 and a half kilograms of body weight. Uh, and so the final exercise test in the treadmill wouldn't, wouldn't be fair because they'd lost all that weight and they'd perform better. So we put a backpack, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, this woman's carrying a backpack and has all the weight she's lost in the last six weeks on her back when she does her final, final performance test. Um, and what we found, the, at baseline, they were able to do uh, close to three hours of endurance exercise at 60% of their peak aerobic power on the treadmill uh, before they came to subjective exhaustion. One week later, this was uh, reduced by about 25%, a little over 25%. And that fits perfectly with the, the data published by the, the Scandinavians that supports the concept of the necessity for carbohydrate and the benefits of carbohydrate loading. Uh, in retrospect, I think it was a mistake that I agreed that we'd do a final test after six weeks. Because if I'd done this, I would never have become a heretic. And I could have had a, a pleasant career and, and a cordial relationship with all my colleagues. But you can imagine that when we, when we published this data showing that these people, even with a backpack, they went four hours walking on the treadmill. Well, I need to tell you the truth, and that is even though they wore the backpack, their heart rate was lower and their oxygen cost of exercise was lower here, which means they were more efficient on a ketogenic diet. So whatever the cause, they were able to do a prodigious amount of exercise. And by the way, they weren't training during this study. They were in the metabolic ward, and the only exercise they did were the tests that baseline one week and, and six weeks. So this was not a training effect. This is a diet effect. But it was clouded by the fact that they lost weight. So, and I, at that time, I was reading the, the, the books by uh, Stefansson, the Arctic explorer, saying that he could eat a diet of meat and fat and hold his weight stable and feel well and function well. And we had the published data from the, uh, when he was locked up in Bellevue Hospital. And so we concocted a diet similar to what Stefansson ate in 1928. We recruited a group of bike racers. Now, these are lean, healthy guys. You can see this is. This guy doesn't have a whole lot of extra body fat. And we didn't want him to lose weight. So we fed him and the other subjects enough calories to hold their weight stable, with the composition being 15% protein and north of 80% of calories as fat. And we kept them on the diet for six weeks. And the question was, can an athlete also exercise uh, after a period of keto adaptation? And uh, the data here shows that their peak aerobic power, that's their maximum ability to consume oxygen at the highest level of exercise they can get to on the stationary bike, was 5.1 liters at baseline. After four weeks, it was 5.0. The, the 0.1 is not statistically significant. They were able to do this peak, achieve the same peak aerobic power after four weeks with no visible carbohydrate in their diet. We exercised them at 65% of VO2 max. They went for 147 minutes at baseline and 151 minutes after they'd been on the diet 
for four weeks. Now, two differences between this study and the one before. They didn't lose weight and they didn't have the potential improved efficiency from weight loss. The other is it was a four-week study, not a six-week study, but the fact that they put in what is statistically an identical performance indicates that there is no hobbling effect to highly trained athletes when you get them on a well-formulated ketogenic diet. Um, the intriguing thing is this, this data here on muscle glycogen, this shows the change in muscle glycogen, so 87 units, uh, that's millimoles per kilogram wet weight of muscle, 87 units were consumed for the first uh, performance, doing the exact same amount of weight work, the same duration, the glycogen use was reduced by a factor of over three. So they could do the same amount of work on much less glycogen, and the reason they could do that is almost all of their fat, or almost all the energy was coming from body fat. And that's indicated, uh, I don't want to get into the details of respiratory quotient, but if the RQ here is 1.0, that means someone's burning all carbohydrate. If it's 0.7, they're burning all fat. At 0.83, this, on this test, it was about a 50-50 mixture of carbohydrate and, and fat. And that's what you usually see in endurance exercise at about 65%. But over here, after just four weeks of adaptation, their RQ was 0.72, which is so close to 0.70, that means they were getting close to, if over 90% of their fuel for this level of exercise from body fat. We had turned these athletes into a remarkable fat burning machine. So um, that stuff got, that data got published in the literature and, and uh, you know, people sort of treated it like you would treat, uh, well, let me not be too crude, but sort of dog poop on a sidewalk, you know. People. Uh, and then until Jeff Volek came along, and I have to tell you, Jeff who's 25 years younger than I, he tries to treat me like a mentor and I try very hard to treat him like a colleague because I look up to him so much. Uh, but he really kind of dragged me out of obscurity and, and said, hey, you know, that stuff was pretty interesting. And one aspect of the interesting stuff he said was, let's look at this paper published in 2005 from, by Venables et al. from uh, the Netherlands. And she and, and her, the group, including uh, Professor Eukendrup, um, in, in 2005, recruited 300 people. Some of them were, were uh, untrained adults and some of them were highly trained athletes. And they looked at, they did an exercise test to find what their maximum rate of fat oxidation was. And what they found was that the lowest rate of fat oxidation among all 300 was 11 grams of fat per hour. The highest was 60 grams of fat per hour, which translates to one gram of fat per minute. Okay, we'll come back to that in the subsequent slide. The mean value was 28, but the focus on, the, out of 300 people, including many highly trained athletes, the highest fat oxidation rate they found in anyone was one gram per minute. So Jeff took the data from my thesis and plotted and figured it out in terms of grams of fat per hour. The lowest of my five bike racers had 74 grams per minute, the highest 112, and the mean was 90. So in, with keto adaptation, either again, my five guys just happen to be complete freaks, or that when you keto adapt someone, you dramatically change them from the carb-fed state to a, uh, 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 a fat-fed state where their bodies become extremely adept at burning fat for fuel. So when you think about this from a point of view of an athlete, hey, you know, all we did was we, made, we allowed the athletes to get back to where they were before. What's the advantage of that? And the advantage is that if you carb load a, a 70 to 75 kilogram athlete, you can get maybe 2,500 calories of carbohydrate into, that, into the person's liver and muscles combined. That's the most carbohydrate fuel you can get into an athlete with carb loading. However, if you take a, a, an athlete who is 15% by weight body fat, and that's pretty heavy for an athlete in terms of high percent body fat, but at 15% of body fat for a 70, 75 kilogram athlete, you got over 100,000 calories of fat. But let's say, okay, let's take an ultra lean athlete who's only 7% body fat. You still cut this down to only to 50,000 calories. But you've got 50,000 calories in this fuel tank, you've got 2,500 in this. It's a 20 fold difference. So, and if you can use that fat efficiently, that suggests that you have a much bigger fuel tank when you adapt to using fat for fuel. 
So the analogy of an athlete hitting the wall, you hit the wall when you run out of carbohydrate. It's like a truck carrying petrol going down the highway. You've got a little petrol tank up here. You've got a big tank of, let's say, of diesel here. When the, this runs out, the, the, the truck stalls, and yet it's got a huge amount of fuel. It just can't use that fuel. So if you took a line from the, this tank here and plugged it in the engine and converted the engine to burn, burn diesel, that truck can go and go and go. So the question is, which fuel tank would you want to have if you're going to go a really long distance, like, say, 100 miles? So there are some people who are in, in California, people around the world who now who are doing ultra-endurance events up to 100 miles duration or even longer. Uh, this is a picture of a gentleman named Timothy Olson. And in 2002, he did the Western States Endurance Run. He'd done it in previous years and it never won. Uh, then he converted to low carb about six months before this race. And here he's running across what's called the No Hands Bridge at mile 97. And this is the first time anybody in this race, the race has been run since 1976, I think. This is the first time anyone has gotten the No Hands Bridge when there's still daylight on the mountains. Uh, he's in the process of, of, of changing the, the, of, um, uh, the kind of the uh, performance standard for the sport. And this is a picture of Tim crossing the finish line. You can't read it probably, but here it says 1446. So he finished in, in daylight, still a little sun on the bleachers at Auburn High School. Uh, he finished uh, in, in, in this race and took 21 minutes off the all-time record. And it got people's attention. But then the, the naysayers said, well, that was a fluke. He could never do it again. Well, P.S., he did it again the next year. It was the second hottest year on record, and he beat, uh, 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 took 30 minutes longer to race, but he still beat his next nearest competitor by 20 minutes. So this is an ev evidence that one can uh, take the low-carb message, which we focus oftentimes you know, on obesity, diabetes, and inflammation. Uh, it may have application to other groups as well. Uh, and so we wanted to start, study it a little more closely. So Jeff Volek allowed me to be a collaborator with him on a study, which he called FASTER, which stands for Fat Adapted Substrate Oxidation and Trained Elite Runners. You, know, you always try to find a catchy acronym and then come up with some clumpy name to, to, to fit it. <laughs> Um, and what he did was he recruited a group of elite male ultra runners, some of whom had been on a high carb diet, who chose to do a high carb diet, some chose to do a high fat diet. Uh, they were aged 41 to 50, I'm sorry, 21 to 45 years old, um, and they'd all been on their diet of choice for at least six months. This shows the, and it's again a lot of detail, I, I apologize to people in the back, but what basically what it shows is their age was 33 or 34, their height almost identical, BMI, I was like body mass, 66 to 68 kilograms. Um, the uh, VO2 max was about 65 mils per kilo for both of them. So very well matched groups, 10 per group. I mean, people look at the day and said, hey, did you make that up? And did, no, Jeff just and his graduate students spent months uh, communicating with people to find uh, you know, 20 people who fit into two groups that were pretty well matched. The high carb individuals ate about 25% fat, 15% protein, and over, uh, around 60% is carbs. So this truly is a high carb uh, cohort for the 10 who ate the high carb diet. For the low carb diet, it's dramatically different. Protein, 20%. Again, this is not a high protein diet. It's a moderate protein diet. This group of runners chose to eat about 10% of their calories as carbs, and 70% of calories as fat. But the obvious difference here is 400 grams of carbs and, and about uh, 65 grams of, of, of carbs in the low carb runner. So huge difference in the amount of carbohydrates. So radically different fuel supplies for these two groups of runners. And for their, uh, the protocol, what they would do is come in the lab in the morning at six. They did a number of tests, including a body composition test and gave them a Again, all these runners want to have something for breakfast, so Jeff gave them a 350 calorie shake an hour and a half before the, the run. Uh, the high carb runners, it was 70% carb, the low carb runners is 70% fat. And then at nine o'clock, they put them on a treadmill and had them just run on the treadmill for two, well, just a mile, easy three hours at 65% of VO2 max. Uh, I mean, this is a tough test to do. And by the way, they were doing muscle biopsies before, after, and then after recovery as well. Uh, and the fact, nobody dropped out of this study, by the way. Um, and a lot of them said they'd volunteer and come back and do it again. So now I want to come back to the Venables data, the data from the Netherlands in 1965, because this shows the 
the, the, of the 300 people, this shows their VO2 max. So if you have a VO2 max of 20, you're extremely untrained. 40 to 45 is about the mid-range of normal. Anything above 60 means you're a highly trained athlete. And this shows the fat, peak fat burning in grams per minute. So remember I said 60 was the highest you saw. So there's the 60. Nobody, and particularly not out among the elite athletes, nobody got above 60. And this is the data from Just Faster study. The high carb runners, mean value was about 0.7. None of them came up to one. The uh, high fat, low carb, ketogenic runners, 1.5. None of them were down to 60. There's no overlap between these populations. These are very well matched groups. The only difference is diet. And what, tell, what this tells you is if you get the diet right and give them enough time to adapt, you dramatically change how the body uses fuel. And you dramatically give them access, particularly give them access to fat uh, as an energy source, which has tremendous implications when you're dealing with obesity and weight gain. So the other way to look at this, this is the, you know, this is the picture that where Jeff says, this is where we fire the, the statistician, because we don't need the statistician anymore. This shows the, the, over the three hours, this shows the carbohydrate use by the high carb runners. And it starts a little above 50% and comes down to, um, uh, uh, maybe 40% at the end of three hours. So you can see it's dropping off, and if they've kept running for much longer, you're probably gonna run out of it. The low carb runners, 90 per, almost 90% fat, and there's no change. They're not burning more and more and more and more carbohydrate out here. This, they're they're met, metabolically stable with what they've got, and this is why people doing 12, 14, 18 hour duration events have come to realize that this is a far superior method of fueling. You've got a 30,000 calorie or 50,000 calorie fuel tank, not a 2,000 calorie fuel tank. And you can just use this and use this and use this. So let me finish up really quickly with some safety issues. People say, that's fine, but you know, there have been surveys done of athletes and, and you know, questionnaires of athletes, and of course they were always uh, anonymous, you know, so we, you didn't know who had to give what answer, but the question, one question sometimes people ask is, if we had a drug that would guarantee you a gold medal in the Olympics, but it would cut 10 years off your life, would you take it? And more than half of them say yes. So yeah, we've got a drug that lets you run and run and run and run on a big fuel tank, but what if it kills you? So, um, and again, uh, you've seen some of this data already from, from Professor Noakes, but Jeff Volick did a study where he recruited 40 uh, people with metabolic syndrome, not athletes, but just 40 overweight people with metabolic syndrome. And uh, half of them were randomized to a low-fat diet that provided uh, only 25% um, or 24% of calories as fat, 56 as carbohydrate, and a modest component as protein. And the other half got randomized to a well-formulated, low-carb, ketogenic diet. Protein was 28%. Uh, Carb, carbs and fat was almost 60 and carbs were 12. Now this was a weight loss study. People say, well 12, that's above 10, that's too high. But this was actually a weight loss study and so they were hypocaloric. So actually some of body fat was coming from here, you know, was adding to this and proportionally in terms of metabolic expenditure, this is smaller, anyway. Um, this shows the weight change, whoops, here. Um, the low carb, I'm sorry, the low fat group lost weight, the low carb group lost more weight Note that they're still losing here at the end. So it isn't like this one was still going down, this one was going back up. Because when we look at LDL cholesterol, it's up slightly numerically on the low carb group, down slightly in the low fat group, but these are not significantly different. But the LDL particle size, which they measured uh, directly, not estimated, um, this 3% increase in LDL particle size is actually a huge increase which means that most of these people, if they had what's called, Ron Krauss calls pattern B, B for bad, moved to pattern A, that is their small dense LDL was, was markedly reduced. HDL cholesterol went up by 13%. There is no drug I as a physician can prescribe to a patient that gets anything like that kind of rise in, in HDL. Triglycerides went down in both groups. Again, people with metabolic syndrome have high triglycerides to begin with, and pretty much any diet you put them on will make it go down, but you got more than double the effect with the low-carb ketogenic diet. And then the important factor that I want to point out is we actually measure the percent of saturated fat in their triglycerides. So this idea that you are what you eat, and if you eat saturated fat, it'll accumulate in your body, 
is a, a myth that has to be dispelled. And, this, and what we showed was that the absolute content of, of um, saturated fat in the triglycerides decreased by 12%, even though this group was eating three times as much saturated fat per day. So you're not what you eat, you are what you save from what you eat. And if you're a prodigious fat burner, you have a, a tremendous uh, uh, capacity to burn fat. And one of the f fats that the body loves to burn when you give it permission is saturated fat. So if you eat it, you turn it into CO2 and water, it doesn't collect in your body, how's it gonna do you harm? So again, you've seen this, this slide. Um, it's getting to be a very popular slide. On the insulin resistant end, we, could, we really have to define that as carbohydrate intolerance. So take away the carbohydrate and the problems like type 2, 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, either get better or go away. At the other end, for insulin sensitivity, you have athletes and normal weight people. And you say, well, they don't need to do this. But as I pointed out to you, if you're an athlete trying to do something beyond a two, two to two and a half hour duration, tapping into your fat fuel tank may have tremendous benefit. You're not doing it for the health benefits. You're doing it for the ability to use a far superior endurance fuel source. And I want to end very, very uh, briefly here with a, uh, what I think is a very important paper that was published in the journal Science back in December of 2012. And this is kind of obscure. It talks about things called histone deacetylases. Well, histone deacetylases are enzymes that control the proteins that wrap around your DNA that determines whether your genes are turned on or turned off. So the term that people use for histone deacetylases is they're gene silencing enzymes. This, so this is what controls when something that you have the capability of when it gets used. And um, what these people did was they took uh, mice and gave them, made them be, go into ketosis. And remember, nutritional ketosis, he says, was one to three. Well, this is one here. If they fasted them for a day, mice have very high metabolism. Just one day of fasting, they get your ketones up above one. Or the alternative, which they chose to use, was they took a little mini pump and planted it in the mouse and, and infused beta hydroxybutyrate into them uh, at the level of just a little above one millimolar. And then they looked at how their bodies defended themselves against oxidative stress. And oxidative stress in most sentences is, is, is included in the same sentence with aging. Okay? And if they infused buffer, which had no effect, or beta hydroxybutyrate, something called hydroxynoninol. Hydroxynoninol is a breakdown product of polyunsaturated fats, and it breaks down in the presence of reactive oxygen species, aka oxidative stress, that they got a dramatic reduction in the, the products of oxidative stress. And just to prove that, that wasn't a fluke, they measured something called actually lipid peroxides in situ in liver tissue. And again, buffer up here, beta hydroxybutyrate down here. So you have this uh, dramatic reduction in just one day in oxidative stress effects shown in this animal model. And again, this is a pitch for the fact that nutritional ketosis is a very important area, an island of efficacy and safety that we need to figure out how to get people to. Because this shows this class of three histo histone deacetylases here, the class one series, one, three, and four, at the range of one to three millimolar, you get a 40 to 50% reduction in the activity of these enzymes, which means you get a dramatic enhancement of the body's defense against oxidative stress. And it's, they do, it's done in the range of one to three millimolar. So my conclusions are that a, a low carbohydrate, high fat diet has been with us for a couple million years. We've had a couple million years to deal with of the fact that uh, we have ketones present. That this, you don't get the benefits in terms of human studies for at least four to six weeks. So unlike the mice, it doesn't happen overnight. And the, in order to sustain that long term, when you're not losing weight, but weight stable, you've got to be, shed your fear of fat. You have to be willing to eat the vast majority of your calories as fat to, to exist in that space. And particularly the saturated fat isn't bad for you. And then I would make the plea that just in terms of the, the, our understanding or our, our, our attitude around the word ketones, this is not a toxic byproduct of fat metabolism. This is a highly desirable nutrient that we need to figure out how to uh, 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 
make available to people and let them have the benefits. Some of that I'll stop and say hi to you from the top of my favorite mountain, which I occasionally climb on low carb. Thank you.